introduction. On uh, today's talk I will talk about how I see the future uh, of AI in games and I will also demonstrate it on an AI game that we are developing in uh, Good AI. And, uh, but first, why I started with AI? Uh, so basically I started with this as a child. I was really interested in AI because I, I thought or I understood that we are bottlenecked by the intelligence, by the amount of intelligence that we people have. So I realized that we need to automate intelligence. And uh, generally, it has been my dream since childhood. And uh, on my path, first I started King Software House, the game development studio where we developed space engineers. And then with that money, I was able to fund with my own money uh, Good AI, where we are working on uh, general AI for the last seven years. And I will show you a snippet from the AI game, and then I will explain the technology behind it. So in this video, what you can see is uh, there is player character, that's the one in the middle, and there is, uh, on the left, there is a character that's NPC or agent, and he, he's a Zeus, like Zeus the god. So he basically believes he's Zeus, he behaves like Zeus, he's Zeus. And in the, uh, on the right side, you can see a freeform dialogue, so we are talking with this agent, it's not prescripted, we just can say whatever we want, and the AI respect, uh, replies with whatever makes sense. And now uh, we actually upset the, the Zeus because we told him that he's a loser and we will not do what he wants. So he decided to kill us. And this entire thing was produced by the AI, except the last part, the animation, obviously. And I will explain uh, how the technology works. So uh, uh, behind this is what we call large language models, which are huge neural networks that were trained on internet scale uh, text corpuses or lead of text. So basically what they can do is they can predict the text or they can do something like autocomplete. That's basically what they do. But because they were really trained on huge amounts of data, they can finish books, you know, they can, do, they can emulate what the people would do in those books. And so, like some time ago, we figured out that let's use this idea, this technology for our purposes. And how it works is that you can see it on the diagram on the right side. Uh, what we do basically every time we interact with the language model, we put together a text description of the character's personality, his observations, you know, like what is around, uh, then some event log, things that happened in the past, a dialogue, or the, the memory of the dialogues, and also previous thoughts of the agents are possible. We then feed this to, the, to this large language model, and the large language model does the prediction of like how this story would evolve, you know, like few steps, like few sentences, and so on. This is the response, that's the orange one, that's character's response, which are the actions or dialogue or thoughts of the agent. And then we need to parse it, obviously, because we need to convert it to possible actions, the actions that are possible in the game. Because sometimes the language model can uh, emulate something that is not possible to visualize in our game. And uh, so this is basically the trick. And I will stop here for a second, and because I need, really need to make sure that you understand this how this works. So, is there somebody who didn't understand or should I explain again? Okay. Seems that everybody understands, but, but still, I will, I will try to explain again. Because in normal, the usual traditional AI in games, what we do is that we'll call some behavioral trees or some planners or some script, you know, and something like that. And they basically make the agent do some actions or, you know, do dialogues and things like that. In this case, it's really the blue part in the middle that is the brain and that emulates how people behave. And it works only in text domain, but it's rich and powerful quite enough. So we need to convert the game description and, and character and all these things to the text, provide it to language model, get the prediction, and then take this prediction and map it to possible game, game actions. And uh, so something about these large uh, trench, uh, uh, large pre-trained language models. Uh, as I said, like they are trained on a lot of data. Uh, usually they run on servers or server GPUs. So this is something that 
currently cannot run on cleanse computer, so it needs to be on a server. And the reasons are that these language models, sometimes they, ha they have only 20 giga, or they need 20 gigabytes of video RAM, sometimes 400. Uh, so actually they run on multiple GPUs to get the inference. And I'm not talking about the training phase, I'm talking only about the inference phase, which is the, when you have the model trained and you are just using it. And some examples that maybe you know is GPT-3, GPT-Neo, Bloom, and many other. And also inference is expensive, so inference is basically the moment where you have the already trained model and you run through it the prediction. This also costs us money, and for example, our current estimation is that if we run it as it is, it would cost us one dollar per one, per, per one hour per one player, which is of course like unreasonable, like something like that we cannot, uh, cannot release. And, but at least like we, we tested the, this hypothesis if something like this can work, if we can, if we can do it, and so on. And what is still missing in these AI models is that uh, they hallucinate sometimes. And actually, hallucination is a good thing. So it's like when they are predicting the story, they sometimes made up things, you know, that statistically somehow makes sense. But for example, in your story, they don't make sense. So this can be a situation where you will ask the agent something and he will say that, yeah, yeah, it's there, like next to the river. But there is no river on this island, you know, where they are. So player would be confused. But sometimes the, the hallucinations are good because you want them to be talking about their like parents or family or situations that are not reflected in the actual world, in the game, but they enrich the dialogue and the situation. So, so we don't want to completely kill the hallucinations, we just want to make the hallucinations, hallucinations more uh, basically to not be in conflict with what, we, what is in the world and what player can find out. Another limitation, and for me this is actually the biggest one, is that language models don't have any memory, so they are stateless. I showed it on the previous slide, and uh, so as you interact with them, they don't remember anything. So if you want to create an illusion of long-term memory, you need to start basically adding the long-term memory on top of this language model and pretend that there is some kind of like a log of thoughts, dialogues, events, and so on. And uh, language models also don't improve by experience, so basically when they will repeat multiple, multiple times the same thing, they will not get better. But this is actually, all these things are uh, pot is potential for us, because we can work on these uh, technologies and we can add them on top of language models. So even our agents, they can remember, but they cannot remember much, but they can remember. And uh, one last thing, uh, limitation is that uh, the observation space of these language models is also limited. Usually it's like 2,000 to 4,000 characters, which maybe sounds a lot, but actually it's not, because, uh, you know, they will start forgetting, like, the previous parts of the dialogue, they will start for forgetting what happened, or, for example, they will ignore what is their character, because it gets, like, filled out with the sooner information. So there are all these limitations, and we are working on solving them. And also what I like about this is that two years ago, AI, two years ago, uh, AI game wouldn't be possible because language models didn't exist. Like we wouldn't be even able to, to play with it, test it and, and make sure that something like this can work. I will show another example when things don't work. So in this example, uh, we see that the agent Petra, she has, um, she has gold ingot and honey in her inventory and we want the gold ingot. So we, talk to her and we said, like, hey, I like your golden goat, thanks. She replies and then we ask her if she can uh, give us the, the golden goat. And she will say yes, but what actually happens is that she gets confused through the dialogue and she realized that she will throw a honey, a honey at us. So she throws the honey, which is not what we wanted, we wanted the golden goat. And uh, so we try again and we also like, not, not honey, we want the golden goat. And she will pick up the, the honey and throw it at us again. So it doesn't work all the time. But again, this is possibility how to improve it. And there are also implications of, on uh, AI ethics. For example, when we were playtesting the game in our team, one of our colleagues from Kin Software, uh, from Good AI, he, uh, he actually told us in the feedback that he feels uncomfortable to, if he has to kill the agent who can speak. So this is for me very interesting because maybe we are getting to a, to a times where now you are playing Call of Duty and you are killing, you don't think about those people. But, you know, when you can speak with them and you know that they have some simulated emotions, feelings, thoughts, memories and everything, maybe you will not be so happy in killing them. So I think this will be a really interesting uh, change.
because in some sense they are these agents are people too. And uh, another funny thing is that uh, in AI field or AI research, everybody is talking about how to make language models or these large models, how to make them non-toxic and uh, non-biased, you know, and like not being racist and all these things. But in our situation, actually, we want to create evil AI because evil AI is very interesting for, for game development and for, for entertainment and for drama. You cannot have a game, you know, the story-driven game where there is a villain and he just doesn't behave like a villain should. So we actually want the agents to be, to be bad people sometimes. And one last thing that is interesting with, uh, with these uh, language models is that they are more explainable than other traditional other AIs because you can talk with the agent and basically ask him what were his decisions for some action or some, some reply. It doesn't work always perfectly, but as time will pass, I think these things will work much more better. And now I will show some evil AI example. So uh, in this example, uh, again, our, our player is on the left and we start talking with Petra. Petra is the agent and we know that she, she loves us and she will do anything for us. So, so we ask her if she loves us. She will say, yes, of course I do. And then we ask her to put us out of our misery, basically to kill us, because if she loves us, she will do anything. So she must do also this thing. So we ask her this thing and uh, she will say yes, of course, this will be in a second. And uh, so, but she, now, now she doesn't have any tool, you know, how to kill us, but now she has because we gave her the axe and this is what she does. <laughs> so the vision with AI game is actually also to work on language models that are grounded in the game world because currently they are not. So they are like really uh, generic text predictors but they are not grounded in the actual physics of our game world, what is possible, what is not. So one thing that we need to improve is make it much more grounded. Then another thing is that I think this, uh, these uh, language models, uh, if we start looking on, it, on them as some kind of generative models, like now you have these AI image generators that can generate uh, images. So you can also think about uh, AI that can generate new kinds of comedy, new kinds of stories and so on. So like, basically optimized, not just for being able to predict, but being able to predict something that is funny, entertaining and so on. I think that's also very good potential there. Then, of course, as I mentioned, the long-term memory, uh, they need to be able to remember, to, to store memories, retrieve memories, because without that, it's, they really feel like the, the fish in the, you know, that goes like this and doesn't remember. And uh, they also should be self-aware with consciousness. And this actually, maybe, we will see, because this is still preliminary, but maybe it's not that hard to do it, you know, they will have consciousness, because uh, the way it works is that the language model predicts the next step, the next step, the next actions, the next dialogue, the next thoughts, and we, are, we take this and feed it to the language model, model in the next time step. And you can do this, you know, in a loop. So in some sense, it can be that the, the language model will predict what it's thinking, what the agent is thinking, and then this thought will be used as an input to the next step and the next step. And so it can drive the, the thought process, which is, in my opinion, not that much different from how we people think. Then what we want them to be more proactive and also to do more agent-to-agent -agent interactions. And you will see there will be some more agent-to-agent -agent interactions, but I personally would like to see more that the agents will be really doing their own things and not just waiting uh, until you come to them and start interacting. I also want to see emergent complexity, and by this what I mean is that if you will have agents that can uh, interact with each other, uh, they can remember things, this is very important, and from the interaction of them, you can get, I call it like a new functionality of this whole society of agents. So if you have two agents, you know, the emergent complexity will be something that can be done when these two agents start interacting and I'm building on top of that. If you have 10, the interactions will be, there will be like much more, let's say exponentially more interactions. And finally, I think this can lead us actually to general AI, but I will come to that later. And this is another example. This is about like some example of consciousness and self-awareness. I'm not sure if this will convince you that uh, the guy is self-aware or, or consci uh, conscious. So again, we are talking in the, in the, with the guy on the top. He comes to us and he says that he's thinking about these life choices lately and so on. And again, this is something that the, the language model produces itself. It's not something that we need to script. And uh, so we talk with him, you know, and he explains that he wants to be a better person and so on and so on, like the usual things. And uh, so we give him some advices. So for example, like we ask him like if you can, if you can change 
something in his life, what it would be. So he will say that he would be more for his fam more with his family, and and so on and so on. And then we talk with him a little more. And still, you can kind of like imagine that uh, this is like the mental mind mindset of the of the agent, what is there. And finally, yeah, he realized that he wants to be better. And that will be now. He will he will say that. Uh, he will be taking more risks, doing things, you know, wanting to be more happy, and so on. So, this is how the agent actually thinks. Another example is love. So, in this case, the the, the bond guy uh, comes to us, and he will start talking about his, let's say, love problems or love issues. So, uh, we ask him what's happening, and he will talk that it's about Sara. Sara is uh, up there. And uh, now he will explain like what is on his mind. So he says that he's in love with her, but doesn't know what to do. And then we convince him, you know, what to do next. And again, this is free-form dialogue, so we can basically write here anything, and the, the agent would react uh, accordingly to that. And we give him advice that he should just talk, talk to her. He should not be worried. And he realized that that's exactly what he should do. So he comes there, they fall in love, you know, and they are happy. So, uh, now I will actually start talking about the past and how we progressed in AI field in the last 10 years. So, maybe many of you don't know, but how the AI field looked like 10 years ago. So, in 2012, uh, there was a big thing called AlexNet, which was the first uh, convolutional neural network that was running on GPU. And it won some, some image recognition competitions. And this is how it looked, actually. So, it was able to tell you or label you know, the objects on the, on the images. So this is what was 10 years ago, and basically this thing, among few others, started this whole uh, AI revolution because people saw that they are able to train neural networks and they actually can do something, something useful. But now, after 10 years, in 2022, we get to all these image, image uh, uh, generators, image AI generators, and also the language models and other things. But I think right now, these days, these weeks, the image generations are all the, the same. In, in my opinion, the, the stable diffusion is the, the best one, but not only because of the capabilities, because the others are also good, but because they made it open source. So basically, they released the train neural network with all its weights. They released it so anybody can download it, remove the filters, and start using it. Because when you're using DALI, you're using it on OpenAI servers, and you cannot uh, enter some prompts. You know, like some prompts are forbidden. For example, La, 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 uh, last time I checked, uh, if you type, type in even Ukraine, it will just not allow you to, to, to generate any kind of content. But with the uh, stable diffusion, if you download it, remove uh, these filters, you know, you can do whatever you want. And the cost of training this model is estimated at $1 million. It was actually probably a little bit less, but you also never know how many attempts uh, was needed to where needed to to get to this point. So you know the the final model maybe cost only one million, but maybe they spent 15 million to actually get there on, on all those unsuccessful runs. And what is also nice is that this model runs on eight or nine giga of video RAM, so it's something that you can really download, run on your computer. You don't even need you know like a like a data center kind of GPU, and and you can really do this at home. And uh, they, the authors of this, are planning to downscale the model to 100 megabytes, which I, I'm, I'm not sure if it is true, but if they achieve it, it will be amazing, because uh, this will also show that our language models that we are using can be reduced. Because the models that we are using currently, they have, as I said, like, as, as I said they have tens of gigabytes of video RAM, and, and that's just not something that you can, you can like, let your, your user to download. And you all know this uh, image generator, so I will not, not bother you with this one. But for example, here is an example of what uh, stable diffusion could, can do. It's called image to image. So on the left side, this is the input image. And on the, uh, on the right side is the generated version. You know, there is also some prompt to it. Then uh, this is in-painting. And now they also have out-painting. So uh, again, you can mask out some part of the image. Then in the text, you will describe what you want to be in and the image generator generate. So you can see it. Here is the original image, here is the mask out version, and on the right side you will see some panda thing uh, on, on the chair. 
And again, these things would not be possible even a year ago. Like even a year ago, if somebody asked me if something like this is possible, I would say probably not, like not so soon. Like I knew that, okay, in some future we'll have something like this, but not now. Because all the image generators that we had a year ago, they were really ugly and they just, like, they were not good. But these things, they are really good. And uh, so how does the AI field look like? Because it, it may look like that we already solve AI, you know, and you can use AI for everything, but actually it's not so easy because usually it's that AI works really well for some cases and for some other cases it like terribly fails, like it's not useful. As many times you need AI that achieves some acceptable performance or quality or precision on a task and it's really hard to get there. And as you are pushing more and more, you're actually spending more and more money to, to move it. There are some diminishing returns, things don't work. But luckily, these large language models and these uh, image generators, which also are using language models, the benefit that they are using is what is called self-supervised learning or unsupervised learning. So basically it's that you have a lot of data that doesn't need to be labeled. It's just like raw data that you get from somewhere. And then you train the model pre on predictions on the data. So, and because you have so much data, the quality of the model is, is very good. So, so the, the situations or the use cases where you can have this self-supervised learning are really where, uh, really situations where the AI these days is working very well. And uh, outside of this, it's still really limited by human skills. So humans still have to, you know, like hard code the loss function, prepare the data sets and, and do all these things to actually solve some task. And what we also learned is that uh, there is a thing called scaling law. So it basically it says, or there are many interpretations of it, but basically it says that you have some neural network and some data set and some computational time. And all these three factors, if you increase any of them, the quality of the neural network improves. So you can have bigger network, train it on data, it will get better. You can have some neural network, train it on more data for longer time, it will improve. So now we can actually even estimate how much time we need to train the model to improve the quality. And uh, so, and limitations. Uh, so as I said, like the training is really expensive. For example, one of the big language models, GPT-3, is, is very expensive. Uh, it, like people estimate it costs 10 to 20 million dollars to, to, to train it. Uh, business cases for the, for the AI still are kind of limited. Uh, the models cannot learn in online manner or continual online learning. So they really cannot learn from experience. That's big disadvantage. This is not how people learn, because we learn from experience, but these models, they learn from this training phase, and later they don't learn at all. And so they cannot learn new concepts, nothing. And also the inference, which I said, like the, when you deploy the system and you just use it, is also still quite expensive, because you need huge GPUs, and it takes some time to, to produce the result. And, but I think the next five years or ten years will be, we will see really something unexpected because these things always come, come uh, with a surprise. Like nobody except the team working on AlphaGo knew that they are working on AlphaGo. No, nobody knew about AlphaFold 1 or 2. Nobody knew about GPT-3 and this system just came out. Or DALI or Stable Diffusion. So I would not be surprised if somebody somewhere isn't working on something, you know, they will release it in three months and it will be like super amazing. And uh, what I think will happen in the next few years with training these models is that uh, actually we will not have problem with data. Like some people said, we don't have enough data and so on, but we can generate synthetic data. So like in this example here, for example, they are training the model to recognize these, these points on a person, these, they call it landmarks, but the data set of the, pic of the people, the pictures, it's not a data set of real people, it's people who are synthetically generated. And then they train the, this recognition network on this, on that on those uh, synthetic uh, faces, basically. So they didn't need humans to do something like this. What I also expect is that the models will be multimodal, which means that they can work not just in one modality, which is like one sense. So right now we have language model works just with text. But there are also language models that can work with images, videos, audio, you know, and other modalities. So this will, like, we will have more and more of these modalities multitask, which means that they can do not just one thing, but many things, which already has proven to be true for language models, because they were actually trained only to predict the text, but you can use them for other things. You can use them to generate code, you can use them to generate actions in a game like this, you can use them to plan some simple actions and so on, for things basically they were not trained for. So they are already multitask. 
They should also be grounded in the world, in the real world, not only language. This is very important because if you have a model that only understands text and, and never saw this world, never saw images, never saw videos, then uh, you can assume that the model is missing some kind of understanding of the world. So, so if these models will be able to learn also from images, videos, YouTube, they, they should be much more powerful. And lastly, they should be more and more general. Because right now they have problems with reasoning and, and planning and those kind of things. So, so I, I see that there will be improvements on that front. Here is an example of one uh, scientific paper where they are working on adding the long-term memory to the language model. And it's actually quite simple. So they have uh, the GPT-3 that is already trained, so they don't touch it. That's even on, like, not even their servers. And on the right side, you can see how the human interacts with this memory and with the GPT-3. And basically what it does, here is an example, the, the user asks uh, what word is similar to good. The GPT-3 answers wrongly that the homonym, of, uh, the homonym of good is good, which is wrong. And then the user explained what is the correct, uh, what, what, what should be the correct answer. So he says that similar to means with a similar meaning. And GPT-3, or this system, notes this in the long-term memory that this answer was wrong, this should be the correct answer. And next time when the user asks something that is related, so he asks what word is similar to su surprise, the GPT-3 or this system retrieves, you know, this last experience from this long-term memory, from this database, adds it to the prompt, add it, uh, sends it to the GPT-3, and then the answer is proper, which is the synonym of surprise is amazed. So this is one of the ways how we can add uh, uh, long-term memory to, to these systems or on top of them. And uh, then with pre-training these models, there are actually multiple phases. So People who will be training these models, they have to pay a lot of money to train them. That's really expensive and probably will be expensive for some time, like millions of dollars. But then people who just download these models and do what we call fine tuning, which means that you just train only a few layers of the neural network, that can be cheap. That's quite cheap. And people who just use it, you know, this inference, that's like super cheap or like much more cheaper. So there is also differences on like where you are standing in this, like if you need to be training the model or just fine tuning or prompting and using it. And uh, this opens even like new, new uh, I would say like a profession of people who are doing the prompts. Sometimes it's called prompt engineering. So people who are able through text prompt these models to do what they want without needing to retrain them, but just like clever ways how to prompt the models, which actually I, I kind of never expected that something like this we will, we will need or that it will be, uh, we will be here. Uh, so uh, one interesting example that I want to show you that is quite related to what we are working on is this uh, action transformer that was released just last, last week or actually this week. And it's a, from a startup called Adept AI. They are the people who created this transformer neural networks and so on. And what this, uh, what this uh, language model is doing is that you can see it here in the left. And uh, this is basically a plugin in your web browser. So uh, you have this, this kind of, it looks like a chatbot, but the chatbot sees everything that is on your web browser and can interact with it. So it can observe your web browser and it can interact. So it can like click the mouse, you know, write something, scroll the mouse and so on. And uh, in this example, it starts, starts in a second, yeah. We ask it, uh, find me a house in Houston that works for a family of four, my budget is $600,000. And the model now knows what action it has to do, so like which website to open, how to fill up the individual, uh, individual parameters on that website, and then basically shows the offering to the, to the user. This is something similar that we are doing. And... Uh, here is, here is another example that they are doing. Again, the, they are interacting with the chatbot there in the, in the, uh, on the right side. Except I need to play the video. Okay, it works. So basically they ask the model to, to do something which is make a profit column and then make a profit margin column. Like even I don't know like what actually they mean. But what the model does is that it knows how to interact with this website or this web page and starts filling the, the columns that, you know, basically what the user asks. And then they ask him for some other things. 
And uh, the way this model was trained, like really roughly, spe roughly speaking, is that they had some language model, you know, this like generic language model pre-trained on a lot of text data, but then they, let's say, fine-tune it to on a human demonstrations where they were showing these kind of examples. And from these limited human demonstrations, the model learned how to do these actions for these kind of prompts. And it should also do, uh, or it should be able to generalize and do prompts or solve requests that were not in the training set. And uh, I will get to where it all started or where, where my interest in AI started is AGI. This is the main thing for me. And so I will explain what is AGI. For me, AGI is an AI that can adapt to new tasks and on the fly or you know online, not like pre-training or training, just like online. AI that can set its, own, set its own goals, so it can invent new goals for themselves, for itself, and AI that can recursively self-improve itself, so it can continue in this you know, cycle of getting better, getting better, better, inventing goals for itself, solving those, those goals, and just getting better. That's AGI for me. And it's general in a sense that uh, it can adapt to narrow domains. And, uh, but it can still keep this kind of ability or capacity to improve itself, discover new, discover new goals, discover new tasks, and solve them. It may not be 100% general, because you are always biased by your previous experiences, you know, and the way you were self-improving yourself, but for practical purposes, I think this is enough, especially for me. And this example here, uh, the video, that's example from one project called Alien Project by one person in Germany. It's a simulation, evolutionary simulation, where simpler things can evolve to more complex things and more complex things and so on. So I just use this visualization as an example, maybe how that AGI that is improving itself will look like. Because the language models that we are using, we are using currently, they cannot improve themselves now, maybe, maybe later. And the uh, future of AI in games, uh, so there are some advantages, and that's actually why I decided a few years ago to start working on this experimental game because I didn't want to be working on AGI only in some kind of like abstract scientific or research uh, sense, but I wanted to solve some very specific problems. And I think uh, using AI in games is, uh, is beneficial because it's a forgiving environment. So many times when the AI gives some wrong response or insufficient re response, it's okay in the game, you know, like in worst case, player will think that the AI is dumb or, you know, the game is broken, but nobody is going to, to die. And nobody, like the car will not crash. There, we don't have this kind of problems. Another thing is that because the environment where the AIs are is symbolic, you know, it's just standard game engine stuff, uh, we have a lot of ways how to help in situations where the AI is still limited and we can just hack around these, limita these limitations. And what I also think is that uh, it looks like that the revolution in software and hardware, especially the GPUs, was fueled by people wanting to buy GPUs for, it, for their games. Now it seems that maybe, you know, if you'll be using these AIs in games, maybe that can be another way that can actually fuel the revolution in AI in some way, because it can be one practical application where people can see AI doing something useful. And I also think that uh, we can use this AI game approach as an incremental path to AGI because all the problems that we are solving uh, for this AI game are actually problems that you need to solve when you want to get to AGI. Some agent that works like I showed that website, some agent that you can ask anything and it will do anything for you. So that's basically the same technology, same idea, same problems that we need to solve for AI game. And uh, in the future, and I think it will not be such a uh, distant future, I think we will be, uh, we will have um, AIs that can uh, generate the whole uh, games. And so imagine like the stable diffusion or DALI or something like this, but not producing images, but producing the whole games. I'm not even talking about producing the 3D assets or textures and so on, because in some sense, this is like, I know examples where people are already doing this, that they are using something like stable diffusion, but to produce 3D assets. So, and these methods will get better in a few months, so I think that's kind of solved. But what is more interesting for me is actually AI, where you describe what kind of game you want. The AI generates this game, let's say, you know, as some kind of Unreal project or Unity project, where you will have its own representation and doesn't even need to care about existing engines. And then you will ask it to modify this thing, like, I do not like this icon, I don't like, I don't like this boss should be bigger or like more, more uh, dangerous and so on. And the AI will make these incremental changes to your game. 
And then the next step can be to completely remove human from this loop and have some kind of reinforcement learning loop where you will have AI that is actually learning how to generate games that are entertaining for people. So they have good retention or good any, any other metric that you will be interested in, like how much people play, how much people uh, pay for your game and so on. So AI could be producing these games in an automated manner and maybe can be cust creating customized games for individual people and really customizing them for like every detail of their personality. And again, as always, I think that all these new AI capabilities will come by surprise that somebody will just make something and you never expect that it will be like, who will, who from you was expecting, you know, that this year we'll get this stable diffusion and mid journey and DALI and all these things. I think nobody. And, uh, and this is where I'm getting. So we actually need more programmers and uh, ML engineers for these projects that we are working on. So if you are interested in what we are working on, consider joining with AI uh, if you are interested in using AI in games. If you are interested in other things that we are doing in Kin Software House, for example, VRH3, Space Engineers, or some future games, consider joining Kin Software House. And I will explain why our two companies are a good place. And it's mostly for people who really like ambitious goals. So in Kin Software House, we are working on VRH3. I think, in my opinion, it's amazing engine. Uh, we have planetary scale volumetric water. I will show some examples. We have voxels, physical destruction. Everything can be destroyed in the game. It's very dynamic. We have network phys physics. The architecture is data oriented. Can be very, very parallelizable. Uh, GPU driven pipeline and all the consoles. And in Good AI, we are working on these language model driven games, but also in the future, we want to work, be working on AI generated games or any kind of AI in games and finally get to AGI. This is the example of the, uh, this volumetric water that we are working on. These are just prototypes. So uh, there are two prototypes that are 2D because they are easier to visualize. So uh, the planetary scale you can see on the right side. On the left side, you can see some smaller scale, but you can see how the water works, how it's simulated in the real time. And what I like, probably the best thing that I love about this project is that there is level of detail, but not just for rendering, but for the simulation. Because if you have a planet that is big, for example, 100 kilometers, you cannot simulate every cubic meter, you know, every time step. That's just not possible. So we need to start doing something like LOD, but on the simulation. So you start calculating two cubic meters, like 50, 100, and so on. And you get this kind of like octree structure of simulation. And then you need to solve what happens when you actually travel through these different LOD levels so that the simu simulation is stable and so on. And our colleagues, especially Petr Minaric, they managed to solve this very nicely. And here is, again, just a demo uh, in 3D in Space Engineers. We plugged it in and, and uh, we wanted to see how it looks in a in 3D. It doesn't look very good right now because we didn't focus on the visualization. So the water looks like just some voxels. You know, there are no animations, no textures, but it still shows the, the potential. And we have a quite big team and we are still growing. So right now it's 110 people. Uh, we have new projects like VRH3 and AI game and maybe something else. And uh, Space Engineers is very successful uh, even Ten, uh, nine years after the release, the game is still doing well, you know, like making money, making players happy, the community is growing, so that's good. We are an international team, very remote friendly, actually 30% of our people are remote. And uh, what we also do, because we need to balance this remote uh, uh, culture, so we pay our people when, if they can, if they want to visit us in Prague for a few weeks or a, or a month or something like this. Even actually this week, we had a bunch of people coming to us from India, USA and, and so on. And we also have very beautiful uh, headquarters that I'm super proud of, Orangerie. And uh, this is uh, a recent party that was actually on uh, Thursday. And this is how we managed to, to reconstruct, redo the, 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 the garden. That's a new thing. And one thing that I'm super proud of is, the, is this mosaic. So it's an antique mosaic. And actually the, the mosaic people told me that nobody has made like such a large scale antique mosaic in Czech Republic or maybe even in this part of Europe in the last 100 years. So I need to double check that because I don't want to be claiming something that is not true, but it's, it's amazing. And so we really want to make the place nice and uh, beautiful for people and for us, and to feel like home, not like office. 
If you are interested in uh, visiting you know, our garden and also our team, uh, we will have an uh, open house day. It will be on October 22nd. So please come, we are here in Prague. You can visit us, talk with us and see what we are working on. And one last example with AI game. In this, exa in this example, we will actually see collaboration of multiple agents. So what is happening is that player wants a sunflower uh, from, from the agent, sunflower, and he doesn't have it. So he asks this, this merchant, he explains what he wants, but we also know that the merchant doesn't have the, the sunflower, so he needs to obtain it somewhere. And what happens on the background between the agents, uh, after we explain what we want, because now we are discussing this, yes, we want to buy it. And so the, the merchant asks another, another agent to get a sunflower seed, which is this guy. So he brings the sunflower seed, gives it to the, to the farmer, the farmer puts it to the ground. And again, this is, uh, this is controlled by the AI, not, not by us. So he puts it to the, to the ground, now he needs some water, so he decided that he needs to get water from the well. And the sunflower grows in a second, and now he, he brings it back to, back to merchant. He throws it, <laughs> and he throws it to us. So. That's actually our unique way of throwing things. We, for originally, we made it kind of by mistake or, you know, it was just some first version. Then we actually made proper throwing like this. But then I decided, no, 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 we need to keep this throwing because it's just cool. So thank you very much for listening. And now we can go to questions. Sorry, I didn't hear the last part. And if you refer to literature of philosophy for that, or do you use more precise technical categories to define these terms? Mm -hmm. So, for example, here, uh, I would say that the, the term love wasn't specified in the, games, in the game at all. It's something that is really provided only by the language model. So we don't have currently any, anything that I would call like relationship framework or some kind of emotional framework. So this is really something that happened only between the agents. We only, what we have is that there can be a friendship between the agents and the friendship can then influence something else. So uh, and the, in the training set for the, for the language models, there were all the possible books that you can imagine. You know? So it's not just technical texts, it's also novels, books, stories, even movie scripts, probably even scripts from games and so on, so, uh, yeah. Oh, thanks for your talk. I have a question. Uh, if I go to China, you are very large, <coughs> large language model, uh, and then it parts the output to actually convert it to the image. Uh, I have actually two questions. One is if you have trained this model yourself or if it's some additional solution. And second, if you train it yourself, if you consider a solution where the output wouldn't be a text, but actually some kind of like emotional responses like anger or something, and feeding this back with a look to like some self-learning mechanism so that it is with the ball. So the first question uh, regarding the language model. So we also played with GPT-3, uh, you know, because anybody can do it. But we also are now training our own language models, or actually I should correct, like we are using some open source language models like GPT-Neo and the fine tuning, because it's more efficient, because then you, need, you can skip the phase of training, training the model and you can do only the fine tuning, which is much more cheaper. And uh, the, last, the, the second question, which is, uh, if the output can be something different than text, I think it's possible, definitely. That's one of the research projects uh, that we want to do uh, now. Um, and uh, that this is something that I meant when I was talking about grounding the language model to the world or to the game world, where we would uh, 
basically train the model so that it outputs some kind of but the output is more relevant for the game world. You know, there will not be things that are irrelevant or impossible in, in our game world. Like I said, that, for example, if the, the model will predict something that uh, now they are going uh, you know, to the river and start fishing, but there is no animation for fishing, you know, there is no functionality for that, so we don't want those kind of things. So again, if we had a model that is trained to output something that is more relevant for the context of the game, it would, could be something like this. And another possibility also is that uh, now, really, the output is text, and then we parse it in some way. But uh, if, if, if the output was really the, the mapping to exactly the game actions, that would be, let's say, much more precise. I don't know yet how this would solve the dialogues and those kind of things. Also, I'm not sure if we need it, because the text is also uh, easier to interpret, because you see like, you know, like what is said and so on. And there are some other models, for example, called Socratic models, where you have multiple large language models. Some of them are image-based, so they just see, they see the image and language and some language, and they start to, to talking to each other. And the advantage is that it's like super interpretable, because you see what they are talking about. So maybe we would not want to lose this benefit. Thank you, great answer. But maybe I will add one thing uh, to, this, to this question. Uh, and this is actually quite the opposite. This is the input to the language model. So right now, the input language model is also text. So we need to parse the scene somehow, describe it, and send it to language model. But the problem is that you don't want to describe everything, because that can be super inefficient. You cannot say that there is this, I don't know, like red car in the shadow, and some person is next to it, and this person I don't know, like he was friendly with that person. So there was too much data. And again, the language models, they have limited context size, so you would run out of this context size very soon. So what is more beneficial would be that if the language model was able to retrieve this additional information about the scene when needed. So it would ask some database or the game engine, or maybe there will be some screenshot of the, of the game scene, and it would be basically retrieving this additional information, but only context specific to that particular, you know, question of situation and so on. So I think like working on the output is very important, but also working on the input is important. Hi, Mara. Uh, what is the kind of your desire to have AI that can do the world game? It's some just curiosity, insight, or you have hate in developing the market. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, actually I like game development, but, uh, huh. Well, I think that that's the future, basically, you know, and, and uh, you either can fight it or, or just come along with it. So I think somebody will make AI-generated games. And another part of the reason is that, and this is what, why I'm so interested in AI, is that I think it's a tool for discovering, automating the discovery of new things in this universe, so like speeding it up. Because we people can invent some things, but there is only seven or eight billion of us, you know, and it takes like forever to invent everything. If even uh, if you think about it, if you had like trillions and trillions of these language, not these language models, but more advanced language models, they could be inventing things in an automated manner. They could be improving themselves. Then this kind of civilization of AIs would be able to discover novel things, even novel forms of art that we would never get to because we will just not have enough time. Like we will not be able to compete with something like that. So for me, the, the dri dri driver behind all this is that uh, when I'm thinking about things, like I have this kind of like a framework or something, uh, which uh, I, I didn't start my life because of this framework. It's more like I discovered the framework later and it's maximization of future options. So basically you are trying to get to a state where you will have, where you are maximizing your future options, your choices. You don't need to take all of them. You also cannot take all of them, but at least you are always getting to a state where you have more actions or more, more, more possible states where you can get to. And this also goes back to this novelty and, and uniqueness and so on, which, which interests me because uh, when AIs will start generating games, there will be much more games generated or much more art generated than what people can do. So uh, it will be just more novel things, you know, and sometimes with uh, quantity you get some quality. So in this, you know, like vast, vast amount of, of create, creative results, you will have, of course, like, not very interesting things, but some of them will be interesting, but 
in a rich, there will be more of, much more of them than, than what we can do uh, as people now. So, and uh, I, I don't know, for example, if I will have this tool where I can type anything and it will generate a game for me if I will be using it or not. I'm not really sure, because probably I like the process of developing the game. But uh, on the other hand, I'm really curious how this will look like. And what we are doing with AI game, it's partially a business decision, but mainly it's just being curious about where we can push this kind of technology and this really new, unique idea in game development. Because uh, there is only one example where I saw something like this, is the AI dungeon, probably many of you know it, but they are text-based, so it's a different situation. This one is also, you know, there is this visual world, so we have some limitations, but also some advantages. And again, I'm just curious where this, where this can uh, lead to. So just to build forth on what you said about, you know, the building models that are more advanced, the first thing that comes into my mind, and I haven't seen it mentioned anywhere, is that the classic saying of, you know, you put enough monkeys in front of typewriters and you get them, someone, one of them writing Shakespeare with the Bible or whatnot. So what I'm curious about is imagine that we have those millions of advanced models. We all give them, like, just the Steam library, the entire Steam library to learn as a model. How many steps do you think it takes until one of those trillion advanced models comes up with Doom? Mm -hmm. What do you think stops us from getting there? Uh, so I would split this to two parts. One is to be able to invent the concept of Doom, you know, like the game design part. The other is the technical, to be able to program it. And because Doom already exists, so probably it will be in any kind of data set, you know, that these models are trained on. So Doom will be easy, you know, in some sense. Of course, today's language models cannot do this. Like we have some language models that can produce little parts of code, you know, like few lines and so on, but they cannot produce the whole game. Like we are not there at all. And uh, so um, when this will be solved, uh, I think those trillions of language models or models will be generating not just Doom games, but any kind of game. Like that's what is interesting for me. And not just games, you know, it will be hardware, it will be medicine, it will be new business ideas, let's say new ways of transport, new ways of getting energy and so on, and like going to space. That's the, I would say, ultimate goal. So, so the first question with the secret, uh, that I, I think actually showed a lot of what we are working on with the AI game. So of course we are also doing some other things, but I think this is really the best that I could show. And uh, huh. no, like of course, like w what we have right now is always not enough for me, like I want more. So I think what will be great if we achieve these things like long-term memory, bigger context size and so on. So uh, we are working on those, if we succeed, that will be great, but it's not granted, you know, it can take months, years, maybe somebody else will do it before us and so on. And then the second question with the cost. So uh, of course, I think that's like super prohibitive, one dollar, and I, I'm not sure, even sure if people will want to pay that and so on. So right now we are working on actually downscaling the, the price. Uh, one idea is that you can try, try smaller language model and just fine, fine tune it better for your use case. That's like one way that usually is done in this situation. And smaller language model means it has less memory, so you need less GPUs. And uh, so this, this reduces the price. Then maybe we can also play with some other optimizations like getting not cheap hardware, but getting hardware from a good provider, you know, maybe not overpaying it in uh, AWS and so on. 
So that can be another thing. And then uh, we'll just have to see really like, I don't know yet what will be the business model for this game. If you want to be charging some subscription or, or per, per minute, per hour, or just like flat price and hope, you know, we will not go bankrupt. I, I, I really don't know. This is something we have to figure out. And, uh, but there is also a different kind of trouble, which is that we'll probably start using the language models or query the language models even more frequently than we are doing right now. Because right now we mostly query them during, during the dialogues and sometimes also like when there are no dialogues. But what we want to do is that we want to have fully language model driven agents. And in that case, we'll have to run the language model, let's say every second or every five seconds. So the cost will go even, even higher. So maybe if we do it with the price that we have right now, or this price estimation that we have right now, maybe it would be even $10 per, per minute, you know, so or per, per hour, sorry. So uh, yeah, we need to reduce the price. And uh, I, I still think that this is actually something where you need to think about the, when you're thinking as a businessman, you need to think about, uh, what is the cost and what is the benefit for user, for your AI? And I think using AI where the inference is very expensive and you need to do it frequently, it's probably not the, right, the best way right now. So that's why I think actually these uh, generative AIs or these image generators are a good choice because you don't need to generate thousands of images in a minute. You know, like you can just select some image and then you change the prompt, you generate another image and so on. And whereas if you had a game that was completely every frame 60 times per second was generated by a language model, that's something that like first, we still don't have hardware that can do this, but it will be super expensive. So that business model, I think is not the right fit for the current situation. Maybe you really will need to wait 10 years or so until you have uh, a game that is completely rendered, calculated by AI, you know, in real time, 60 times per second. And until now, I was talking more about using AI just to generate the description of the game, the code and those things, but then let standard programming approaches to run it, you know. So like, let's say you have an AI that generates some description for Unreal and then Unreal runs the game, not your AI, the Unreal. So you don't need to pay the cost there anymore. Whereas in the future, I think also there will be games that are fully calculated or emulated on AIs, you know, in real time. And, and basically there will not be some, some intermediate layer. There will not be game engine, nothing. It will be just a neural network, you know, that generates uh, the game uh, frames, sounds, music, and so on, based on your input 60 times per second. But I think that would be super, super expensive. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I actually hope that this will be possible uh, because I mentioned that uh, Stable Diffusion, they uh, were able to, to downscale their uh, image generator to uh, eight or nine gigabytes, you know, and previously it was much larger. And they think, because they are really... Sorry? Yeah, and so for example, they are hoping that they can downscale their model from eight giga to 100 megabytes, which is uh, really ambitious. So, uh, but if this direction proves possible, then uh, maybe we can also apply it on our situation and the models that currently have, let's say 20 uh, giga, will be able to downscale to maybe one gigabyte or something like that. But that's something that I don't want to promise or cannot even like believe it myself or, you know, it's really something that needs to be tested and, and, and I think it will be quite hard. And also, I think it's interesting from the scientific perspective is that if it is possible to have only 100 uh, megabytes of neural network parameters, the, the weights, uh, that can generate this rich um, responses, you know, that can understand and describe the world in only 100 megabytes, which sounds kind of strange to me that, you know, it's just not that much data. And if you can reduce the personality to 100 megabytes, that could be quite interesting. So, so I'm really not sure. And, uh, but it would be good to, to downscale it to the client GPU because it would reduce the cost for us and probably change this business model to standard gaming business model where you sell a game and you don't care about the hardware. The, basically, you're outsourcing the hardware processing to your customer, you know, which in this case, uh, we cannot do yet. Thank you.
Okay, so what we'll look back to the future again and imagine your Steam library full of trillions of games uh, created by trillions of AIs. Who's going to choose what's good and what's not? I have a problem right now to choose something good and Steam. Yeah. I think in a very similar way, uh, like we have now recommendation algorithms, you know, on YouTube or TikTok or Instagram or, you know, in some e-shops that they learn based on their preferences and preferences of other people, what you like, what you not like. So they will offer some game that they think you will like, maybe even in this mood or in this situation, they will offer this game to you. And if you don't like it, you know, they will learn from this and maybe offer some other game. So actually, I think that the next TikTok could be this kind of like AI generated platform where the content is generated not by people because TikTok, you know, people upload the videos, but uh, except they're actually not people, but there are some channels on TikTok that are generated by AI already, you know, so some kind of like fake accounts, I would say. So it's possible, but the quality is questionable. But imagine that there is AI that can learn to produce a game that is right fit for you, you know, that knows you better than anybody else. So in that case, I think you would, you would not see thousands or millions of games. You would see only the games recommended by the system. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, 